So, dann kann er die Show anfangen. Herzlich willkommen bei JKTV, Jazz Keller zu Hause, mit einem richtig tollen Interview heute Abend. Ich, ich freue mich richtig drauf, Eugen ist auch schon aufgeregt. Ich muss mal hier YouTube ausmachen wieder, das gleiche Problem wie immer. Das ist immer doof, wenn man sich selber hört. Wir haben heute Abend einen ganz besonderen Gast. Wir haben immer besondere Gäste. Und heute unser besonderer Gast ist Vincent Herring aus New York. Der besonderer Gast, ja. der ist einfach ein Star. Ja, genau. Und diesmal wollen wir gar nicht so viel reden. Eugen wird gleich ein bisschen History erzählen. Aber, Aber I will introduce you now. Mr. Vincent Herring, here in the Internet from New York. <lacht> you are on the screen. You, you are, are on the screen. Everybody can see you now. Yeah. Um, welcome and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I think we have, or will have people from uh, both the United States and from Europe and maybe even uh, some other places abroad. And um, I just want to start off by saying all topics are open. And um, I know quite some people have uh, questions about current events in the United States. I'm certainly happy to talk uh, about those and any musical questions. I'm happy to answer also. I'd uh, like to start off by saying that um, uh, Jazz Keller is one of the most with Nat Adler. Somewhere else in Germany, and they didn't have a, or they no. had a microphone. But they wouldn't give him the microphone. He said, oh, you don't need it. It's such a small club. He was like, I need the microphone. Uh, and so then they gave him a microphone, and they just didn't even make it audible. I need that. So, so he was stressing himself really hard to play. And, you know, it was a great concert. We had fun. You know, every, everything was good. The next day at the Jazz Color, he took his horn out to warm up, and it was like... Phew. Nothing was coming out. He was looking at his horn and taking it apart and pulling things out and just trying to figure out what's wrong. And he had developed uh, what's called Bill's Palsy, and he couldn't play a note. And I remember I thought to myself, he's never going to play again. And I started crying. I was like, oh, this is terrible. And then we got to go and play at the Jazz Keller. And the first song that we played was um, Janine. And I remember playing and Nat stood there holding his horn faking like he was playing but he was not playing he was just totally pantomiming doing like this and and we were playing the melody and and you hear the harmony part really loud because i'm playing the harmony part and uh, we had a, a guest on that tour uh alvin batiste was on clarinet and um and we played the harmony parts And solo and stuff, and that just stood there, you know, enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he sang a couple songs. Never played a note for the rest of the tour. He couldn't. And um, yeah. and I and I thought that was it. And uh, but um, once he got the proper diagnosis, uh, it was only uh, some weeks that he couldn't play. And eventually he um, uh, retained and got his chops back. But anyway, that was, that's, that's one of the things I always think about when I think about Jazz Keller. And also there's a, um, a picture of me. I believe it, it's from that day of, yeah. that sh um, of me playing chess. And people always say, Aha! Yeah, yeah. Das ist, äh, <laughs> Kamera auf uns. And Kamera auf uns. In Germany you were playing Kamera chess. Usually uh, that picture from the Jazz, <laughs> jazz Keller. We are picking it up from the wall. <laughs> And so we're picking it up, or you pick it up. So, of course, we have this one here. What about your camera? You know, my dear. So, and Vince, Vince can it not see, right? Yeah, you must him himself tell him, because he's not on YouTube yet. Right. And we show it, show it to our visitors. Okay, and what year is that? And that was 89. The cannibal, the cannibal Agency with Vince, with Ivan Batiste, yes, Larry Williams, uh, Willis, Walter Booker, Jimmy Cobb, uh, the, the whole family. 
Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, Vincent, let me say something. We, it's the internet is perfect now again. We had a little issue, by the way, when in the first two minutes. So everything should run. If you can see, you have to refresh. It's like this. Sometimes everybody's at home streaming, but we're good now. So refresh if you can see it. <laughs> refresh. It's always good to refresh. Yeah. And so. Ever Vincent, time for, yeah. for Eugen's history. For, yeah, I for, prepared for. something, a special screen. You have to look there in front. So uh, Vincent, Oing will tell, you, tell the, the folks a little bit about, um, about you in, in German, right? Oh yeah. So. Also, willkommen im Jazzkeller zu Hause und uh, an alle, die nur nicht jede CD und jede Platte mit Wins haben, uh, zum Beispiel, oh ja, yeah, Background Music. Ja, wir haben ja was ganz Tolles gemacht heute. Da ja, läuft die Musik von Vincent im Hintergrund. In the background, Vincent's like music is running. English. By the way, your music is running in the background for the people. And I can tell you a little bit. Very little bit, very little bit. Auf geht's, let's go. Also, Vincent wuchs in Kalifornien auf. Ich mache das ganz, ganz kurz. Nahm Unterricht unter anderem privat bei Phil Woods und arbeitete nebenbei als Straßenmusiker. Also, es ist alles nicht so leicht. Aber richtig bekannt wurde er so 1987, 93 als Bandmitglied von Ned Adderley. Und, äh, und äh, der Bruder von Ned, Cannibal Adderley, hatte einen wesentlichen Einfluss auf seine Musik. Aber Ned Adderley war so ein richtiger Close-Up-Freund des Hauses. Äh, mit äh, welcher Kamera? Mit Ned. <lacht> ja, es, äh, also. Äh, Musiker gehen ja immer nur von uns, äh, sie, sie sterben nicht äh, und, äh, und außerdem haben wir ihre Aufnahmen. So, also das, das war die Inspiration für den Vincent und er spielte mit allen großen Musikern des Jazz, wie man sich vorstellen kann. Und es gibt eine Herr und äh, der Auftritt damals war eigentlich mehr eine Art Bebop Music und die FAZ schreibt äh, Wait, Bebop, for, yeah, for, yeah, for Vincent. Now I can read the critic from the. Oh, very short. Yeah, but on uh, on this evening, uh, was das Bebop für das Lehrbuch zum Studium gut geeignet als Konzert eine Geduldsprobe. Aber inzwischen gibt's vom Vincent die tollen Soul Jazz Sachen, wo die Seele von der Adderley Familie so wunderschön drin ist. Da gibt's die Uh, soul Alliance und die Soul Chemistry und Soul Jazz. <lacht> du, ist das alles zu sehen, ja. ja. Und die letzte Begegnung, bevor uns die Viren hier stillgelegt haben, auch auf der Tour live im Jazzkeller. Und im Hintergrund läuft, läuft ein Musikstück Composition by uh, Joris Doodley. Welcome to our friends, Wins. Yes, yes. So Vincent, how's life in New York? What's up now? Every every week it's changing. It's like here, right? Yeah, well, I have to say that this is the strangest event that ever happened to me in my lifetime. I can imagine, yeah. To be confined to your home for such a long period of time to watch uh, professional sports franchises, seasons canceled or postponed. Um, it's been amazing. You know, I also teach in uh, three schools and to finish out the, the school year uh, online was something I never imagined doing, but it was kind of good because uh, I got my techniques together a little bit better to teach online so next semester when I'm on tour uh -huh. uh, in, instead of sitting in a sub I can uh, <laughs> maybe teach online a little more um, but no it's, it's been um, it's been uh, earth shattering in terms of uh, business um, just making you understand how fragile life is and mm. uh, when Nat Adderley was alive and I was in his band We used to often talk about current events, but, you know, because uh, I would pester him about his life growing up and 
how he and Cannibal Adderley learned how to play, and, and how did you know a diminished scale this, and, you know, and ask these kind of questions of him, and uh, he just laughs, but he would answer them, and, um, but I would ask, but he would ask questions of me also, and he would have me, uh, he'd say, well, what's your opinion of uh, on affirmative action? And uh, for those of you in Germany who don't know what affirmative action is, it's uh, um, where the government uh, gives slight preferential um, um, preferences to uh, minorities for different tasks or things. And so, for instance, going to school, you need certain scores to get into these schools. So by asking, how did I feel about affirmative action, we were talking about um, colleges at the time. And... Um, you know, uh, there's a there's an Ivy index to get into the Ivy League schools, uh -huh. uh, and that index is uh, calculated by the strength of your high school that you go to, of course your grades, uh -huh. of course your and they come up with this this number, and you need this number uh, if you're playing sports. You have to be in the Ivy index in order to be recruited, and I believe the number is 141. Uh, okay. And. and uh, and so NASA, well, do you think that uh, a black person, if they have a 139 to get in over a white person? At the time, I was like, of course not. This is terrible. You know, we're on equal footing. And he just like, big, big dummy. And he would explain to me why um, he was for affirmative action. And he, he said to me, when he um, graduated college, he and Cannonball, uh, Cannonball was teaching at a at a local high school, and Nat went in to interview for a job that was advertised in the paper. And he had all the qualifications. He had just graduated college. He had a little suit and tie on. He goes in for an interview, and the lady says, may I help you? He says, uh, yes, I'm here for the job interview. And I says, oh, okay. And then she went and got her boss. And uh, he comes up and he says, uh, may I help you? He said, yeah, I'm here for an interview for the job. He said, the guy just looked at him and said, get out of here, nigga. And that was it. That was his job interview. And he explained to me that so many things happened to him and in his lifetime. He explained some of them more in depth. He said when people would get a job, when, when his friends or family got a, a job, a simple job at the post office or as an operator, that was a job with benefits. And they would have a party because it was a big deal. And so this is what he grew up with. And of course, this generational uh, opportunities and generational wealth affect everything that's been going on for a long time. So it's not that um, black people don't have opportunities right now, even though some of those things are hindered. It's just that they have such a, on such an uneven playing field and they have to compete. So he said, yes, yeah, the person has 139 and, and, and He's trying to get into this Ivy League school, and then somebody else has 141. Fuck him. You know, excuse my language. That was oh, good. Approach. It's after eight. We're in Germany, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was his, that, was his, that was his approach. And, uh, and he was about the nicest guy that you ever want to meet. Very fair person. Genuinely loving. And, uh, and, and it was interesting and eye-opening that he would have those kind of opinions and uh those things shaped my views on a lot of things today, how I view them. Yeah, it's talking about this topic. I mean, the Corona was now the last two months but, in the in the but, in the in the but, topic. No, but, but he, he talks about Adderley and so the music. To, yeah, you yeah. should play some music and so yeah, that people that's, you know, before we getting too yeah. deep into the <sighs> uncomfortable topics. Yeah, be it Corona or the what's happening now in your country, Vincent. Everybody, see what's up. Let's show some show great, great uh, music of Vincent first. And I have something nice to show, which is in the HR Big Band. You were here in Frankfurt, 2013, I think, or yeah. some, something like that. Yeah. And let's show our audience the amazing skills of Mr. Vincent Herring. Here we go.
Okay. We're back. We're back. Das war Vincent Herring with the High Air, the HR Big Band. Back right. in the days. Frank Ford Radio Big Band. Did you play there also, Vincent, uh, on this when they on this night when you played with the HR Big Band in Frankfurt? Did you have a gig? 2013 probably. Oh, no, no? Special for that. Uh, was you, uh, I did, it was, it was uh, a production. First of all, I, I met uh, um, everyone at Jazz Keller. Yeah. Uh, I came to the concert and, uh, and then they hired me, you know, for the following year and um, and so we we did. I forget maybe a week or ten days or something. Um, it was a tour and uh, there was a bunch of concerts and. Uh, I don't remember where we went. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Philip, show us yeah. some, some pictures from yes. this. Uh, yeah. I, I have some very cool <laughs> photos from Eugen. And you are next to it with the screen, so everybody see the photos in you. Uh, from the early days when you were on the stage uh, in Jazz yeah, Keller. From, I don't know, the two, early 2000s. 2008, huh? 1980, something. And then, it, then I got a great compliment. From I get a, which you, year? Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, that? What is that? That was on your on the record here. For oh, yeah. Um, we will over, over a little bit. Uh, it's the other direction. The 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 you mean inside the the. the, the, the you can't see it. You have to move it over. Oh, yeah. there we go. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So yeah. Regina and Danny. Yeah, Regina and Danny also. So showing memories. Also the Cannonball Legacy uh, photo Eugen, no? from the yeah. Jazz Gala. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I can't also. believe I'm the last survivor of that band. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, you cannot imagine was, we were so close to Ned and he's a funny, great person. <laughs> great yeah. showman. <laughs> Yeah, he really was. Yeah. He really was. And, and, uh, and I'm in the, the owner of the Jazz Killer since 1986. And we had him four, five, six times. Also with the Paris Reunion Band. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, it uh, was always it was always fun having these guys on stage. In a smoky room <laughs> this <Yeah>. time. <laughs> I almost forgot about that. Back we, then, the people smoked, yeah. Yeah, we, it, I changed it. it. Let me see, is, is Jazz Keller, was it a bomb shelter? No, it was a middle age uh, uh, Keller, it's 400 years old, but it probably also was used as a bomb shelter in World War II. Yeah. Right. And so you have to imagine going underground in this. Dungeon yeah. and everybody smoking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This was this was what it was like all over Europe. Yeah. And um, man, and your clothes would smell like smoke. You would have, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. And ham smoke, yeah, but this oh, was yeah. standard. It was the same in the states, and uh, and I remember um, I hated it so much because I didn't smoke, but. I was surprised that it was banned all over the world so quickly. It was uh, really an amazing movement. But I remember the Italians were the last people <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to really accept it because they would be at the airport <laughs> yeah. blowing smoke up at the sign laughing. Exactly. Yeah. At the Greek too. And Greece was also taking a long time. Yeah. I, I see until, t uh, well, I went two years ago to Athens and I see the bus driver and the public bus smoking out of his window yeah. inside the bus, <laughs> public bus. <laughs> uh, so, some weeks ago, uh, we got a visitor from Canada. He is an old Frankfurt guy, but lives and works in Canada. And he comes down a little bit drunk and said, when did you change is after 12 and I can, I can, I can see the stage, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he missed the smoke. Uh. Yeah, it's different. I don't miss it, but um, at the same time, it did kind of create a different kind of atmosphere. I don't know. Um, but no, I don't miss it. But I, I kind yeah. of wonder if, if we went a little too far banning it 
everywhere. I mean, uh, you know, there, there are some concert sites that are no smoking. And, you know, you sit it, but kind of in the jazz club yeah. setting, it, it, it kind of, I don't know. And, and I say, I don't smoke, and it's really an irritant yeah. for me. But um, uh, it just seems, I hate to use the word natural, but it kind of goes together. Uh, you know, it, it, it did, except for those few uh, clubs that were like... <laughs> I like I like the picture. Uh, is this Dexter Gordon on the blue note with the smoke? It's a very very famous famous picture. He is was sitting somewhere for blue note, and but yeah, I remember the the first the first jazz concerts I went to. Um, I have to tell you that uh, one was Dexter Gordon. And Dexter, one was uh, yeah, Bill Woods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and I would look at how they smoked and how they held the cigarette. And Phil Woods, sometimes, at, one, at least one time I caught him, he had a cigarette uh, between his um, index and his middle finger, and he was playing <laughs> I was like, wow, that is incredible, right? And then he, and he'd take a whiff and he'd go back to playing like that. I was like, oh man, that's incredible, right? And so I was at home and I took my mother's cigarettes and I would practice like that. She's like, what the hell are you doing? I was like, well, this is like good for your fingers and helps you. You have to keep them on, on the keys right in place or else it won't work. And then uh, and, uh, she knew that was a terrible idea. And I, and I never I never smoked ever, but uh, but it was still a part of my life, like I say, seeing uh, all those great musicians uh, and, and smoking was just uh, such a, a normal part of their uh, daily rhythm. If you, if you want to go to a real nice smoker bar, you have to go to Berlin. Berlin is smoker's paradise. <laughs> every, every cocktail bar in my hipster area, you can't smoke inside the bar without leaving it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, uh, Vince, one question. Uh, you know, we started this show two and a half months ago when really everything was locked down. We all had to sit at home like you over there. But the, in these times, many things changed. Any club opened in New York until today? Okay. You know, I'm, I'm in touch with... Uh... Smoke, smoke, is yeah. I, I play there a lot. Yeah, yeah, and that's I've, I've been sending him articles, yeah, you know, this is happening. And it, he's like, mm, I don't think so. Um, but I, I, I have seen some broadcasts coming from uh, Smalls. Smalls, I don't know if it's daily or weekly, but they've been doing some broadcasts where they have a, a band set up on stage and... I can hear chatter, but it's not an audience. Uh, it's a live stream. It's a live streaming. Yeah, probably friends and family. And they've been having a broadcast concerts of live stream. So Smoke is, is thinking about doing that. And um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm dying to play, you know. I mean, uh, I mean it's only so much... Uh, You can practice without playing and writing music and everything else. Now it's getting to the point to where, you know, I really uh, need that um, outlet of expression. So um, I think I'm going to start having uh, sessions in my home uh, again. Yeah. Um, so. so basically, it's nothing, nothing yet open. They're not open for public direct officially. No. Yeah. Uh, Monday this week was the, was the first phase of... Uh, opening New York City. Uh -huh. So yesterday I saw a bunch of restaurants that had outdoor seating. They were, they were all packed, filled with people. A lot of them didn't have masks on. Um, and it looked like old times. It really did. Uh -huh. So um, I think things are coming back slowly. It depends on how hard the second wave hits because there are, there's definitely uh, tick ups in some of the places uh, that pe people have been defiant and uh, have kind of flaunted the laws and now there's a little uptick. But we have major problems here in the United States. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, is, that is that the information is not dependable. 
So they may choose to hide the fact that um, that there's a, a, a uptick uptick in, 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 in the disease during this boom period because they're more um, concerned about the economy. So uh, yeah. we don't know. So it's, we don't know. It's so, the same. Uh, it's the same here. Yeah, we are. And before, yeah. uh, before, uh, before we too, have too many sad <laughs> stories and situations, please play some music. Okay, Oim doesn't like to talk so much about the uncomfortable things. I like to talk about the uncomfortable things because we need to know what's out there. What? How is the life in New York? <sighs> okay, let's show some music. First yeah. music with with. Yeah, I, I got a nice clip. Um, it's uh, just play it. You you tell us later what it is about. Yeah.
sind wir auch wieder im Studio. Kleine Ballade mit um, Vincent Herring aus Holland. Uh, Vince, you like traveling? This, this concert was in Holland. You like traveling to Europe? Is it a popular spot for you to hang out? Yeah, of course. I think it's been um, popular for jazz musicians uh, for forever. I mean, that's uh, one of the one of the perks of the job. You know, that's why I'm not in school half the time. I'm on tour, but um, no, I always look forward to going to Europe and Japan and every place else that uh, that I frequent. And um, it gives you a different view on the world and makes you uh, uh, question other things in your yeah. life. Uh, and you see the the best and the worst the world has to offer. So I'm grateful uh, for the opportunity to travel as much as I do. Is it necessary? I, I had some American artists that say um, I, Wayne. It was Wayne Escoffery, for example. He tell me it's really important for him also to go to Europe for the touring. Just working in the states is just not financially enough. You need to go on tour in Europe. Is it for you the same, or you get along in the States very well? <laughs> well uh, it, it helps probably to have a little tour in Europe, to have a better better life. Yeah, I, you know, like I say, um, I know Wayne has a university job also. Uh, yeah, it's just a balance. It really is. Um, I mean, all I do is music. I spend... Um, a little bit of time uh, doing research on to invest in the market and and I tour around the world that's all I do so Philip, uh, please translate jazz is nun mal für einen kleinen Liebhaberkreis in der ganzen Welt enthusiastisch natürlich die Musiker sind handwerklich und ist von Inspiration die besten überhaupt und, warte, warte, warte. aber das warte aber dazu muss man durch die Welt reisen können. Ein Glück, dass das geht. Yeah, I, I'm kind of say that uh, jazz is a music for inner circle, right? For for not for the masses, right? And in order, wie war das? To und ein Glück, so und da muss man durch die Welt reisen können. Und ein Glück, wenn jemand wie Vince so beliebt ist yeah. und die Möglichkeit and, hat. And it's important to travel all over the world to present the music. And how lucky you are that you are able to travel all over yes. the planet and perform and show this art and we Something are happy like and we are happy having you time to time on our little stage yeah 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 no no, no question i'm grateful and what i realized that actually this was something that was shared um to me by matt adley is it's people like you guys that are responsible as well as the artists for continuing to um have this music uh, presented to the public. You know, we need places to play. We need um, people that are genuine and love the music and uh, and present it and allow the artist to um, present him or herself uh, uh, the way they hear it. And uh, so it all works together. You know, we uh, people writing about the music, hopefully uh, exposing a new generation to the music. I know um, when I first started teaching, um, at William Patterson University, uh, I got a call from Mulgrew Miller, and I, he asked me if mm -hmm. I wanted to come and take a saxophone position there. And I was like, nah, no. And he was like, why not? And I was like, I'm not doing that. And he was like, what, are you kidding? He, I was like, nah, I'm not doing that. And he was like, yeah, be kidding, man. So we, we talked a little bit, and he says, why don't you just try it for a semester and see what you think? And I said, mm -hmm. um, okay, I, I'll do that. And uh, kind of to help you out, and we he, we both laughed. And so here it is. I don't even know how many years I've been there. Uh, it's in the teens now. And uh, at a time like this, I was so grateful to have William Patterson because you know while everyone was filling out uh, unemployment uh, documents to get unemployment, I was still receiving checks for school. I was like, I can't really fill out these documents because I'm not unemployed, you know. And so, uh, yeah, it was kind of funny how that worked out. Now, when I was growing up, musicians of, of a similar caliber, uh, they just didn't have, they just didn't take these jobs. It wasn't necessary because their work schedule 
uh, touring schedule was so incredible. So the idea of teaching in school, that, that's something, that's something kind of new, uh, new you know, in the last uh, decade or 15 years or whatever. Um, you know, usually uh, it was unusual for a musician uh, uh, of my stature or Mulgrew Miller stature to be uh, teaching in schools with some rare exceptions. But now it's pretty much the norm. It really is. I'm showing parallels, some uh, great photos of, of your life that <laughs> from yeah. the past Pri until today. Privates too. Yeah, <laughs> private stuff, yeah. Because this is the special thing about our show that we introduce you, the artist, also, yeah, from a different perspective. Vincent, you have children. Do you play instruments? Well, you know, um, <laughs> well, both play instruments growing up. Uh, my son is the oldest. He played saxophone. He played drums. Uh, both played piano. And my daughter, Sophia, she just graduated college this year. She's the youngest, and she uh, played piano first and, uh, and played flute. And, and the moment they graduated high school, neither one of them played. Uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can do it like Dave Brubeck. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, you know, it's interesting because as you look at, at society and, um, and what place there is for people, if, if my kids were really into music, like really a burning obsession and, uh, about it, then of course I would do everything I could have to uh, expand their musical education. But I just believe music should be a part of of any complete and good education. And very, very few people are gonna play music on a professional level. And, um, and very few people should try to play music on a professional level. If you have uh, an exceptional gift, and if, if you uh, are obsessing about playing music, then that's something that, that you, can, you can pursue. And um, the difference is you put in the same kind of hours that you put in to be uh, a dentist or a physician, um, the difference is uh, there's not a pot of gold at the end of the, mount, uh, end of the rainbow. <laughs> musician, you kind of have to make your way uh, to this. For some musicians, that will be successful. Um, others will not, and not necessarily based on uh, talent, but there's uh, uh, many factors that go into it. So uh, my daughter is on her way to becoming an architect. And my son is a financial money manager for uh, Pepsi, uh, Pepsi and Lay's potato chips, and Lipton Tea. It's all one company. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. yeah um, no, that's great. Um, Pepsi. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to say, Vincent, I had something on my mind. I had something on my mind. Ah, Joris Dudley. I see a lot Joris Dudley on the photos. Yeah. You have a special connection to this great drummer? Yeah. Yeah, Joris is one of my best friends in the whole world. And uh, I met him in New York. And in New York, um, you know, we were all doing our things, trying to find our way into the scene. And Joris was in New York. He would occasionally play with an uh, art farmer, Benny Golson. Yeah, that's yours. He would occasionally play with Art Farmer and Benny Golson, and um, and it wasn't doing much. And and ironically, the club that we call Smoke now was a club called Augie's back in the day. Uh -huh. and, uh, and yours had a gig there, and he called me up, and he's like, uh, would you do a gig at Augie's with me? I'm like, nah, I'm not doing that. You know, and, and we just we just developed a, a good relationship, and and we always stayed in touch. And um, you know he's a great guy, a tremendous musician, uh, uh, an amazing composer. Yes, uh, yes. He really can really really write some music. And uh, like I say, we just we just get along so well, and uh, we both dream up projects and uh, and make them happen. He's living in. Um, Vienna, Austria now, but he yeah. used to have an apartment in New York in Manhattan for a while, uh, and then he left, um, and now he's been back in Vienna for God knows how many years, a lot, a long time. We, we had also an interview with Champion Fulton. You know Champion? The, she's a Absolutely. 
Yeah, she played also with Joris, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Joris played with all yeah, the Yeah, it's a small European world. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she's very talented. Yeah. And, uh, and her father plays trumpet, I believe. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, yeah. Like how, how is it with more music life with Wins? No, let's talk a little bit. Oh, the time yeah. is going so nowhere. <laughs> yeah, my, we, have to, we have a lot of things to talk about. Okay, talk. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, Vincent, I have a question about, or you bring me a song a little bit out of the concept. Um, we had the Corona crisis. It was everywhere on television, um, in Germany and the States. Now we're having the Black Lives Matter. And I see, if I watch German television, I see impressive images, footage, uh, what's happening over there in the States. Um, how's, it, how's it in New York? Is there demonstrations every day and um, does it affect personally your your life now what's going out there on there okay well it's interesting because i was one of those people who would look at the protests on facebook and i was like this mm. is terrible you know it's like you know they're so comfortable doing any and everything they like because You know, they have us, we're protesting on Facebook. They really don't care. And so um, I was one of those people that was like, you know, they actually need to get out and from behind the computer and, and really make uh, a physical presence felt and, um, and make, the, make it a little uncomfortable for them. And so um, while I don't like to see destruction of anything and I like normal, normal, normal things in my life, I am uh, very pro um, the protests that are going on. Yeah. Is it inconvenient for me? A little bit, not really. You know, it's, it's a message uh, that needs to be heard and sent. Um, I think it's, it, it goes beyond uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, I think um, police brutality in the United States is a big issue. And yet, uh, dis disproportionately, black people are catching the end of the stick more than others. But um, uh, there's a, a good measurement um, that can be found on, on the internet, on legitimate sites, uh, that measure policing around the world. And if you take black people out of the equation, white people in the United States are being brutalized way more than they are. In, in Europe and other parts of the world. They, and, and they're numb to it here and they have no idea because they do even more to black people. And, and, and finally, um, you know, the, you know we're, we're speaking up about it, but, but it's, really, it's really the real issue long-term is police brutality. And it's the nature of how, po how policing is taught. And there's a great um, mm. clip from a, a group called the Young Turks, and, um, and he shows policing around the world in the same situation, and, he, and, and statistics, he's like, you know, in Germany, the police shot this many rounds in a year. In New York, in, in America, they shot it in two days, you know, it's like, in, like in the same thing, and it's like, uh, uh, it's, in, it's incredible, the, the numbers are really incredible, and, and uh, law enforcement Here, I think the problem uh, is not only the character of some of the policemen hired, but also the training. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I believe that's really comes to the, to, to the problem, and it looks like it's many other things. And, uh, and it is. It's, it's a real issue. Um, me, have I ever had serious problems? No, I haven't. And I've done weird things like um, after playing a, a concert uh, in Los Angeles, I remember... Uh, Uh, me and Carl Allen, a great drummer, mm -hmm. we, we had this convertible that we had rented and we went up <laughs> into Beverly Hills at like uh, two o'clock in the morning. And the only reason we went to Beverly Hills is to look at the houses. You know, it's like kind of inspiring, you know. And, uh, and so we're driving through Beverly Hills looking at these amazing houses and we come up on this park yeah. almost near the, the entrance to Beverly Hills. And I could see the, the police... 
right there in, in the car, and they're looking at us in this little convertible. And uh, and and Carl and I, we joked about rather than not they would come after. Us. They didn't come after us, and um, and so I, I haven't I haven't had a lot of problems. But I also remember once to having this conversation with my son about well, you know, things happen, but the police in general are good. And the very same day, or it might have been the next day, <laughs> we were driving somewhere, and I was parking my car, and I bumped the car in front of me while parking, and this cop jumped out. And he started cursing at me, can't you see this? And we just like, and you know, and he just was like real threatening. And my son just sat there and when he left and he was like, as you were saying that, you know, so <laughs> uh, it, it's possible to have problems anywhere. No, yeah. no question. But um, the policing needs to be, uh, uh, style needs to be changed. And yes, Black Lives Matter uh, is a very important movement. And I remember the first time I heard the term, it was kind of natural to say um, all lives matter. But it was because I yeah. didn't understand what Black Lives Matter was about. And for, for people that are listening, uh, of course all lives matter, but that's not what it's about. It's like yeah. uh, indifference to black life is so stark and so consistently um, differentiated that, that it's, it's a cry out for saying, yes, our lives matter as well. And so um, that's why, you know, it's, it's even inappropriate to say all lives matter or blue lives matter or whatever, because there's just more to it than that. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, yes, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, for whatever slight inconvenience that I may have, uh, I'm grateful uh, that they were protesting. Yeah. And Vincent, I saw that you are from Kentucky originally, right? Yeah. And... I suppose it's also regionally different. It depends on the area where it's maybe stronger or less strong. Yeah. Well, my father still lives in, in the town that I was born in, Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Um, and I go to visit him every once in a while. And, uh, and he originally started out as a sharecropper. Um, for those of you that don't know what a sharecropper is, that's where... He um, works a farm land that belongs to someone else, and then they um, share on the profits, and not uh, okay. you know usually the majority going to the land owner. And it took him years, you know, before his family was able to purchase a farm. Uh, and then they had maybe maybe like a thousand acres, twelve hundred acre uh, farmland that they um, worked. And, uh, and my father also worked for an organization called Job Corps. Uh, where he would get his full uh, week's worth of work and pay uh, by just working on the weekend and sleeping through uh, over at Job Corps. And what Job mm -hmm. Corps would do is they would take um, kids who had been arrested. For so let's say you get arrested for stealing or something, but you know they would send you to Job Corps if they felt like you could be rehabilitated. And at Job Corps, they would teach the, the kids skills. They would teach them how to weld, how to repair a car, how to, um, uh, uh, how to farm, how to do all of these different tasks so that once they left Job Corps, they would have a, a, um, a task that they can do uh, and a vocation that they can use to make money with. So uh, it was something that he felt great about and I do as well. And it's uh, a great thing in society because here in the States, um, everything is, is, uh, college oriented. It's like, um, no, you know, it's like not all kids are college material, you know, and, and, and that's no, no shame in saying that. It's just that, that it's just the truth. Not, not all kids are, are college material. Not all kids have, uh, been reared in a, in, in a direction where they're going to succeed in college. But that same child who may be a problem in college and drop out could be taught a skill early and they could be a great contributor to society instead of a nuisance to society. So um, I love um, the concept of uh, programs like Job Corps. Uh, my parents were divorced early on and my mom moved to California. And, and uh, so as I got older and I had kids, I said to her, I said, you know, it's terrible that I grew up without my father 
Uh, and she said, if it wasn't for me, you would be a farmer. Oh. Uh. What's wrong with being a farmer? Yeah. <laughs> that's, just, that's another story. Yeah. yeah. You know what, Vincent? I had been. Um, you have some country yeah. music. No, I. Had, you know what, um, Vincent? I spent one year in North Carolina. Okay. Really, I was. I, I made a high school exchange year, 1996-1997, and I also visited New York, and I. So, I, and I traveled all over the states back then. So I also know that there are different areas, different vibes in New York. It's a lot different to North Carolina. They're everywhere nice areas. Oh, I, re I remember. <laughs> but I remember we, we we drove a little bit fast in a school area, and the policeman uh, passed us slowly. And said, "Sir, that's not German autobahn." <laughs> yeah, it's they, also, these yeah. kind of people there you've met also. No? Yeah, they stopped. Uh, <laughs> they they're stopping us there in North Carolina. Yeah. No, no, yeah. that's other, other sorry. But this it ha happened in, in Florida. Ah, we we yeah. rode in the school area and the, uh, yeah. passed us by a motorbike bike. So, Sir, it's not German Autobahn. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is. I, know, school area is uh, very important, it's, uh, driving slow. No? Yeah, yeah. No, but I, I know that the states are divided. As I say, I was in North Carolina, I stay in a. a white area there for poor white people it was at the beach and i had a girlfriend she was mexican there <laughs> yeah and she was very tough so hello lorena if you see, hear this maybe <laughs> and and you know she came from tough background from chicago the the dad was had issues she had a stepfather the brother got shot uh she came from the south side i think and then she ended up in this province and i was together with her and i even felt and I'm pale as a French bread, then <laughs> I had also issues there because the, the local people there did not accept me so much. For them, I was a stranger. I was maybe the same color, but I was not one of them. And I was with a Mexican there together. So I felt, what's up, really? And in New York, when I visited in New York, I visited my stepmom's uh, mother. She's black, and I was in Spanish Harlem there. And I felt... This is my, that's, that's my area. I felt very home there and, and I had my experiences in this country, yes. Well, let me give you the rest of that puzzle that you're not seeing. <laughs> um, I used to have a, um, a country house upstate New York, maybe uh, two and a half, three hours upstate New York. And yeah. people that were around the area, I was um, in the Berkshires, but on the New York State side of the uh, of the Berkshire Mountains. And there were some people up there that are very, very much like you would expect uh, uh, stereotypical um, um, South, um, you know, kind of racist and views and stuff like that. But at the same time, it was very cosmopolitan, all the uh, sophisticated people there in the uh, Berkshire area. So it, it exists in New York State. Like the guy that used to cut my grass. Um, I used to kind of overpay him, and, uh, and my uh, wife said, why do you do that? And I said, hoping he won't come rob us uh, <laughs> for the two weeks that we're not here, you know. And, uh, yeah. But it was that kind of vibe. And in North Carolina, the last time I was there, and North Carolina is, um, is it, it can be great. It can be great. And I was playing a concert um, in North Carolina, and all of a sudden, uh, in the audience, guy walks up to me, Branford Marcellus. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> like, oh, I moved down here. I'm like, oh, and then, uh, and uh, so he moved down there, and he's living down there. And uh, Joey Calderazzo, the piano player, followed him uh, down there, and, and they're doing the things. Not only is it uh, an amazing, uh, um, uh, cheaper cost of living, but you know, there's some other opportunities for his. Uh, kids and he felt it was a better environment for them at the time and um so north carolina's not that bad depending on where you yeah. are yeah 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 <laughs> you know what um a little change of topic i have a question uh regime my mom she's uh, telling me on facebook somebody asked 
uh, you something, Vince. Um, he, somebody would like to know what about a sex book that Vince wanted to publish decades ago. Isn't that terrible that it's not out? Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, seriously getting close to it now. Um, uh, I would be um, surprised if it's not out by the end of this year. At least the manuscript would be ready and uh, it's just a matter of it um, uh, being produced. One of the reasons, um, you know, just, just my, my personal not getting it done kind of thing, Uh, but also, books now, like CDs, are ripped off so mm. much that there's no real money in it. And um, so it's, it has been a labor of love, and, uh, and it's one of the kind of dragging my feet to because um, it's not the uh, uh, financial uh, payout that you, that you may have thought it was. But uh, it is coming because it's almost, uh, almost ready. And we have another question. Uh, from Cynthia Blackman, she asked us, I changed the camera so the people see me, um, Vincent, what was your most memorable and exciting moment in music when you first arrived in New York City? Uh, and by the way, so many of our innovators were alive and well and playing, they were so accessible, such an amazing time. Your most memorable and exciting moment in music when you arrived in New York? Well, first of all, Cynthia... Blackman, I assume that's Cindy Blackman. Um, no, no, she says it's not she. It's it says not she. Cynthia, Cynthia. Yeah, no, no. yeah. It's not the musician. No. Okay, I was yeah. assuming it was Cindy because I talked to her no. a couple of weeks ago. Um, okay, Cindy. so uh, for me, when I arrived to New York, um, just the fact that, like you say, you didn't think of it at the time, but it was like all of these. Uh, giants in the music still around and still uh, still roaming the earth so you could hear people that were so shockingly good and just so head and shoulders above everybody else that it was um, at times greatly inspiring At other times, it was, like, depressing <laughs> because, you know, like, I remember the first time I heard uh, Freddie Hubbard, you know, you think that it would be inspiring, but I was, like, totally depressing and shocked, and I was like, oh, my God, is this what it played professional music? And uh, his skill set was uh, so amazing and so organic, and it just seemed an impossible task and um, and at the time McCoy Tyner playing the way he did um, even a guy that uh, I thought was not very good uh, Michael Brecker I got the shock of my life when I heard Michael Brecker he came and uh, played um, at my school I was going to a school called Long Island University in, um, in Brooklyn New York and he came And he played with my student ensemble. And I remember I was just shocked. Just, <laughs> yes. <laughs> just in complete shock. I'm like, oh my God, he can play. Jesus Christ. And it was like, uh, and so there were a lot of guys around like that going to hear Art Blakey. You know, um, the first time uh, I met Lou Donaldson, I was going to a club. Uh, um, Barry Harris's Jazz Cultural Theater. And outside the club was uh, a guy named Jim Harrison, who was just uh, you know, a fan of the music and a patron of the arts, and, uh, and, and uh, Lou Donaldson. And they said, what is that in that case? Is that a saxophone? I said, yes, sir, it's an alto saxophone. He said, you don't know nothing about Charlie Parker. And I said, yes, I do. And I said, he said, you don't know nothing. And I said, I, I know 25 Charlie Parker solos. And they just... <laughs> Out laughing and they were just laughing and and uh, and they were just teasing me and asking me silly questions and here it is years later I understand exactly what they meant and um, it's like if you never heard Art Blakey's press roll it's like if you never heard Freddie Hubbard when he was just on 
unbelievable. Uh, if you never heard McCoy Tyner when he had that kind of power, if you never heard all of these things, um, you have a different perspective. And so when I try, you know, as I teach, you know, one of the things I'm big on is listening diet. And as I introduce certain people to these kids, like um, uh, um, uh, Eddie Harris, you know, and you know who Eddie Harris is? And yeah, they, they think they have no idea. They have no idea. This is a guy who was like an amazing musician. And, uh, and as they get more into it and listen to him and they start to realize uh, it's not about what, what uh, Downbeat says is great. It's, you know, the music is way beyond that. So I, I miss um, seeing those kind of people. Uh, that is Cindy Blackman, the drummer. In fact, yeah. one of the first experiences I had, I was walking, uh, I think it was between uh, Grand Central and to the, uh, going to the Port Authority. So I was walking down 42nd Street, and she was playing on the street uh, with a saxophone player named uh, Larry Smith. And uh, what's my man? Uh, 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 his name escapes me at the moment. That played uh, uh, the double saxophone, like uh, right. ensemble and Kirk. Uh, uh, his, his name escapes me at the moment, but she was playing with them, and um, and I remember standing there listening to Larry Smith, and I was like, this guy is like unbelievable. <laughs> could not believe how good he was. And I was like, if this is what's playing on the street, what the hell am I going to find in the clubs? So I think the, <laughs> yeah. the big thing was the overall mm. talent and the overall musicality was on another level in New York. George Bray, that that's who the uh, saxophone player was, George Bray. Thank you for that, Cindy. Um, yeah, so just the, the, the level was, was uh, amazing. And, and, and hearing people like Cindy, you know, Cindy, uh, you don't realize that, that uh, uh, there aren't too many people like that in the world, no matter where you go. You know, she is super special. Um, and um, so that, that's part I miss, missed a lot. That was uh, what shocked me is, uh, is I realized that for all the hours I practiced, that it was nothing special. You know, there were people that were more talented that were doing more hours, you know, so, um, and there's more factors that go into uh, developing yourself. So, um, yeah, that was, that was uh, most. Uh, and Bianca, we have, hello to Bianca. Uh, she's a good supporter of us. She right. tell me on right. YouTube that she love your personal stories to hear. Yeah. Ah, yeah, and now, I have a, before Owen brings me out of concert again, there's, there's saxophones, yes, they are, but they're custom-made saxophones. I mean, I know what's up, because I'm into the bike scene, I used to be a bike messenger back in the days, custom bikes, wow. But I saw your saxophone, I said, Jesus, this, is this a saxophone or is this a piece of art? Um, both. Both. <laughs> So, I have an idea. Before, Vincent, tell us about the saxophone. I'm showing an awesome video from a Japanese artist. What's the name of the Japanese artist that makes your saxophone? Tomoji. Tomoji, he's the uh, saxophone technician for yeah. Yamaha. And he, he lives in New York. He's on assignment in, in New York these days. And, and you know what? I, I share now the saxophone with you. And I have a YouTube clip, so... Bada bing, bada bong. Tell us a little bit about the saxophone while you can see these images. Vincent, go ahead, explain to people the, spe this, the saxophone. 
Okay. So for for many years, uh, I played a Japanese form called Yanga Sawa. And, uh, and Yanga Sawa, the manage, the import and export manager died, and, and uh, the new guy came in, and, and our relationship was just not good, and it was just not going to work. And, uh, and so I decided how to play vintage horns. And I went back and I bought um, several Selma Mark VI saxophones and I settled on one that was really great and I really loved it. And um, and so just by chance, uh, I was uh, in Yamaha shop doing something and, you know, I met Tomoji and he was a nice guy and I, um, you know, I had a good rapport with him. And so... He asked me if I was interested in playing Yamaha. I was like, not really. I'm just going to play uh, Vintage Selma Mark VI. I'm going to play the very best that I can. Uh, and uh, I'm enjoying this. You know? And so um, and he said that, you know, they wanted to make the world's best saxophone. And I was like, uh, there's no such thing, but um, I, I appreciate, you know, what you guys are trying to do. And um, so he gave me a couple things to try, and I tried them. And, and I liked it, and it was good, but I still was playing the Selma Mark VI, and that's what I was enjoying. Um, and it was just by chance, I was on a tour with Eric Alexander, another saxophone player, and um, I ran into this old vintage Yamaha saxophone that was shockingly good, but I mean, um, I actually bought it on the spot, and I played it... Uh, uh, on this, on the remainder of the tour with Eric, and, uh, and I asked Tomoji about it, and he explained that at some point, you know, Yamaha put a lot of money into trying to make uh, the, the same quest of trying to make the world's greatest saxophone, and uh, they put a lot of research and a lot of money into it, and um, and so some of the, some of the early um, YAS 62s uh, were special like this, and. Um, and I just happened to get one. And so I, I really, really enjoyed it, and I was playing it. Um, and then um, I ran into another, um, uh, what's it called? It was a, uh, 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 an 80, the uh, 82Z, uh, but from a uh, saxophone manufacturer in uh, Japan. And he has a relationship with Yamaha because... His father was one of the original uh, technicians that helped develop the modern Yamaha saxophone. And uh, so he could get parts from Yamaha. So he had a what, what we call an Ishimori um, Yamaha. And basically because he could get parts, nobody else could get parts from him, but he could. And so he would made it in a way that I played it and it was better than the regular Yamaha. And I took it in. And these technicians are no, the same horn. Say, I'm like, you can say what you want. This horn is better, and it was. It was truly better. And um, and so Ishimori was. Uh, he wanted me to play his horn, and I wanted this Yamaha horn that he was making. And so basically, it was like you can have this horn for free, or you have to pay for this horn. And I said, you know what? I'll pay for this horn. And I took it back to Yamaha. And I said, why is this horn better? And they said, well, it's not, except Tomoji. Tomoji listened to what I had to say, and uh, he considered that what I was saying was true. And, um, and he analyzed it, and he, and he took into uh, consideration some of the things that, that made that horn better, in, in my opinion. And he took into consideration uh, what it was about the 62 that I really, really loved. And he started making um, this horn for me. And the end results were so shockingly good. And the horn played so amazing that I could finally put down my Selma Mark VI and feel great and feel comfortable. And he was so elated that, uh, of what they had achieved in, uh, in building the horn like that. Because for years... Um, uh, Yamaha and the Japanese in general have been making great horns, but a notch below Selma. Just not quite there. Almost, mm -hmm. but just not quite there. And this has been the story for many years. And so finally to have reached the point to where they made a horn 
that was as good or better was remarkable. So uh, all of the um, the the ornaments that you see on yeah. that's that's an expression of uh, joy and jubilation because they actually did it. So I just got lucky and uh, benefited from that. I, every time I, I touch that horn or play that horn, I always uh, think uh, that that should have been Phil Woods' horn if he was still alive. Um, because uh, Kamoji, you know, made horns for Phil Woods as well. Um, so it's it's it, it is a, a remarkable horn. Um, it happens to look amazingly beautiful. It's super beautiful. Um, yeah. He he, uh, he you know took the uh, uh, the stylings on this King Super Twenty with the pearls on the side and everything, and he put them on there for me. You know that's 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 cosmetic, but you know it meant something to me, and, and I really enjoy it. And uh, um, yeah, so being able to play a horn like this every day um, is is inspiring. And so um, I'm really, uh, you know, like we talked about, everyone uh, uh, playing a musical instrument, yeah. my kid, and I said should be a part of a great education. Well, here's an example of a guy that played, but his calling was in something else, you know, we don't need him out here, you know, playing uh, jazz saxophone, trying to do his thing, but he's found his calling, and he's really uh, gifted, and uh, he's an amazing uh, artist uh, and technician in, in developing these things, and so uh, so I'm grateful um, to have met him and grateful to um, have that saxophone. So, Dear children, if you are rehearsing very well and you are getting as good as Vincent, you might get one of the, these sax sax customized saxophones one day. So rehearse well. Schön üben immer, dann gibt's auch so ein Saxophon. Jetzt wollen wir mal hören, wie das klingt. So, um, I have a last clip for my audience. Um, Vincent, that was uh, you in the Count Basie Orchestra, by the way. Ach ja. Yeah. And Eugen is a very big, big uh -huh. band fan, so let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's a question. 
Vincent, we have a question. If you play still your Mark VI. No, you know, uh, it, 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 it took many years to find a, a horn that I was content and extremely happy with. Uh, no, I don't play the Mark VI anymore. Okay, that's the question. Ah, so now coming. You can buy CDs, of course. Yeah, Vincent Herring have tons of CDs out. I was checking Discogs. You can go way back into the past and find great stuff. Um, I have the two recent CDs, and um, that you can purchase with the Bird at 100. Um, this is Bird at 100 is the latest, right, Vincent? Yeah, yeah. Please. Who's, who's on it? Bobby Watts, w Watson, uh, Gary Bartz, a lot of other cats I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. and you have the other one, Hard Times. Yeah, so you can buy them probably on all platforms. Vincent, where yeah. you can, can people can buy them on the, your website too? Okay. Um, you can you know, like, come up. Something like that. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I miss, I miss and, and some person. some more Who's with friends of us. Buying the CD. Yes. And then uh, this so uh, yeah. um, and oh I have yeah. to go upstairs to my so, archive. Support your local artist. Listen to some music of him, buy a CD, oh, buy yes. two CDs, buy three CDs, uh, buy your family CDs yeah. and your sister. And, and, and the artist supports us. Yeah. 2010. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so much for having me as a guest. Yeah. Yeah, Vincent, thanks for having you. Um, sorry when our English is sometimes not so flowy like your English. <laughs> but we do our best, yes. <laughs> I, I appreciate just the fact that uh, you guys are uh, uh, speaking English because when I speak German, you can't help but to do it. <laughs> Und ein bisschen Zukunft. Yeah. Yes, yes. And yeah, let me talk a little bit about the future. Of course, we hope to be open soon. Uh, our, our, by the way, Vincent, our laws are a little bit looser now in these days. Um, we are allowed, I say it in English because you, we have no international people here. Yes, we might be allowed to reopen under certain circumstances of high, a lot of hygienic things we have to take care of. Uh, maximum 34 people, 1 meter 50 distance around the person. You need to wear mouth protection when you're going to the bathroom, restrooms. Only one person at uh, at a time, uh, no service at the bar, no queuing. We have to change the whole system. We need to think about that. Eugen just ordered a lot of material um, that we have hygienic. to... Hygienic. Hygienic articles, contactless, uh, disinfection um, stuff. Yeah. Some... Uh, I, I read the newspaper and, uh, and the television, the time after Corona. We don't have a time after Corona. Yeah, we got to live with uh, this, the, uh, I suppose, the, for the next uh, months. We, we, and have, we have to arrange with this. We have to live yeah. with this and find good ways yeah, to so. have our musical life. Our so, let me make it short. We still need your support. You can support us also, if you wish, on Patreon. Yeah, we don't get too many new Patreons. The crisis is maybe over for many people, but not for the artists or venues like us. It still continues. We're happy, happy if you uh, watch an online concert, a live stream concert, donate. We try to start soon. Yes, and hopefully Vincent also will be next year back on our stage. And yeah, yeah it's just, you know, the, 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 the problem is the, the, the flights, all these international things, planning. I mean, what, what can you do when you don't know what's up in two months, three months? I've had so much stuff canceled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what about your cancellations? All the year, I suppose. <laughs> you you always will be careful for the yeah. European tour. <laughs> also, Vincent, I, I probably... You want a familiar upshoot? Yeah, up sheet? yeah but just Vincent, want, you were playing probably now in Italy, Japan or Korea, I suppose, uh, these days, everywhere. The only, the only <laughs> good news out of this... And we are also good news. But the, well, the only, I, was, I 
I was yeah. going to say that, um, you know, like everything that was getting canceled early on, uh, I have a, a tour, like a, like a month long tour in Japan and they moved it from the summer until November at just by chance and, and said that, uh, um, in, in the summer, the Olympics are going to be happening and, uh, can we move to November? I was like, sure. And then all of this stuff hit, uh, you know, I'm supposed to do, um, uh, a tour, um, for Jordi Sonion with these three altos with Jesse Davis and Justin Robinson also, man, everything has just gotten canceled and it's, and it's been terrible, but hopefully, uh, this tour in Japan happens. And uh, certainly, um, hopefully in 2021, we get back going because this music feels best and it's played best live. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and I know from the experiences that you guys have had being in the club, you know, some, yeah. days, are, some days are unbelievable. And you know what that feels like. It's a special feeling and it, uh, it keeps you motivated and interested um, so that when you uh, go there every day, um, you, you never know what to expect and it becomes uh, you know, something, something special and it really is that's why we mm. salute these dungeons and these like uh, no light clubs because they're special places man and, uh, and like I say the memories that I've had uh, even in your club it just you know we can't replace those those uh, are yeah, yeah. Uh, valuable cornerstones of, uh, of my life and uh, of music and Anna, tell me, what about the Grammy? You're the Grammy Award man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I swear I do have a Grammy. How does it feel to have a Grammy? Does it feel better than with, with, with a Grammy or with a... <laughs> yeah. You know, what's funny is when you win the Grammy, um, you know, the little statue that everyone gets? Uh -huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you have to buy the statue. Oh! oh. <laughs> oh. I Use to buy the statue. Oh, give me a break, really? <laughs> yeah. I, got a little, I got a little certificate, a little document. I think I sent it to you. Yeah, you sent it. I, I don't know what happened with my slideshow. Um, it's it didn't show it though. Yeah, but and maybe. So, but I, I can I, I nah, it's too difficult to find it. Yeah, but I, we have a certificate showing too. So then, uh, a couple years later, I call up the Grammys and I said, "Yeah, I won a Grammy in such and such a year." And I would like to buy the statue. And they said, oh, we don't do that anymore. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, wait, wait. So I can't get the little statue. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Vincent, it's, it's, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Thank you. So you yeah. can... We... I'll be sure and tune in to your, your, your project now that I know what's going on. Thank yeah. you so much for inviting me. And thank you so much for... Um, presenting the music the way you do, really appreciate it. Can feel your love. And, and yeah, it. yeah. We were, as you are not in the rush. Sometimes our artists are in the rush, and here's also Anna now. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's a give and get situation to explain it also. <laughs> and the you know we, we the musician need a stage like yeah, the jazz killer you're here, you're here, or or the no it's okay the musicians need a stage like the jazz killer or the smoke jazz club and we need the musicians and we need to have each other and it's it's the crisis here really Vincent if you go out now uh, here in Germany you have the feeling everything is all right never anything happened people go out no mask nothing it's full demonstrations out there. And it seems to be also all right for some folks, but for the artists and for club owners, the restrictions are very, very tough still. No, and can you imagine owning a club like, yeah. um, you know, like Birdland in New yeah. York City? Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine the amount of rent that this guy pays? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? and I think there, there will be also a lot of changes in the next months. A new order in the world. <laughs> ah, new, new world. Oh, yeah. I think, yeah, we try to do the best. We do the live streaming. We're talking with our, our artist. But as you say, a live stream is not the same as being in a club. Yeah. No, but I, but I appreciate this. Um, in fact, um, uh, let me know if I can help put you in touch with anyone else. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, the, the, you know, the, the, some people say, ah, oh, this is a, a very nice combination. We have the old man next to me, you know, the jazz killer <laughs> owner, and that uh, hipster guy next to him. It's a funny <laughs> constellation. New, new and uh, Yes, and we have a, we have a, here's the belly, yeah. <laughs> yeah we this have a, we'll see you later. <laughs> yeah, sure, later. We'll, the, you'll see this. <laughs> So this will be the new jazz uh, jazz killer member here, the small body inside this belly. Yeah. We hopefully it's coming uh, when this crisis is not so strong in August three. It's the time. Maximum, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wish you all the best. All right, yeah. thank, thank you, Vincent. You. So I say bye. Thank you for being here, we, talking with us. Yeah, it was on the camera. Yeah, and now our camera, <laughs> yes. so everybody's together. Yeah. He's a, okay. Yes. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Mach's gut. See you. Yeah. Ciao. So, danke fürs Reinschauen. Das war wieder JKTV mit Vincent Herring heute Abend. Bei uns geht es auch weiter. We will continue on the weekend uh, live streams. with the Brazilian li live music with Brazil jazz with uh, lots of percussion. Yes, Dres Dimensional, Dre Dimensional with uh, Giovanni da Silveira and um, other Brazilian artists. And Sunday. And Sunday we have Oliver Leicht from the HR Big Band, by the way. I saw he was playing. Alto player. He, yeah, he's the uh, also clarinet player. And uh, he's on Sunday there, so you, we have a nice live stream. And and we hope uh, we will open the stage soon. Uh, yes. Looks, looks not bad. Yes. And I have to say again, please don't forget us to support your local jazz club, your local jazz musicians. Buy the CDs. Any art forms, buy CDs of your local people, <laughs> of your whatever, yeah? yeah? But support us, support them. You can support us on Patreon and PayPal and we continue the show because only with your support we can do these type of things and the world will be very boring without art and without music me. and life. And I have to say also again, buy a solidarity ticket because <laughs> live music cannot be free. It cannot be free because it's, you know, there are some people there performing on the stage. It's a work. It's not only art, it's their work. I have to say it. Really, it's the truth. Yes. <laughs> so support with a solidarity ticket. No, that's All it. Right. <laughs> you practice a little bit. Yeah, I practice. No, it's a, my inspiration from your country. You know, from your country. Yeah. Because, and actually, I wanted to end already two times. The thing is that people are worried that uh, live music is not regarded as a, as a valuable good to pay in this crisis time. Everything's free. This live stream is free. That and people are worried that they say, "Ah, oh, yeah, but the live streams were always free. <laughs> Why I have to pay now twenty-five dollars entrance? I can go also to the internet." Well, it's no fun on the internet. If you... uh, we educate. We will educate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I, uh, we, are, there are more people who likes real life music, yeah. and and they know that they like to pay for this. Yes, of course. And times will be normal again. So, see you soon. In us, let's say. Yes. Okay, now finally. Uh, Vincent, see you soon. Oi. Keep it up in New York. And uh, thanks for being here. And you are now on the screen. Yes. <laughs> and Vincent will be soon at the Jazz Killer for good, for sure. Next year, we figure something out. Yeah, this will be over soon. So, see you. <laughs>